Well, hello, hello, guys. Good morning. Um, I'm thrilled to be joined here this morning for a little impromptu casual chat with two of my favorite badass teachers in the world, Paul Rossi and Frank McCormick, otherwise known as Chalkboard Heresy. And, you know, guys, we don't have an agenda today. We just thought we would get together, have some coffee. Frank is uh, apparently has broken into his school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And for, for a stream live from his classroom for however long he has that classroom left, given, you know, given his precarious state. And I'm sure we can talk about that. <laughs> um, but Frank and Paul, welcome to the channel. And, you know, I'm looking forward to just a nice little chat this morning. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks Carl. Appreciate yeah, it. It's good to be here. Yeah. So you guys are both, well, I mean, Frank, more so, you are really still like in the belly of the beast, huh? Like what is going yeah. on in the land of schools? I mean, um, they've been kind of quiet. I got a, uh, a letter over the weekend, a certified letter from the district attorney, which was in response to a complaint I made to HR about how they've handled, you know, certain anonymous complaints to me and some things they did, I thought were really out of line and they took no responsibility. I mean, it was such a joke. So I kind of fired back last night, a, uh, interesting email which i can i can read parts can read you kind of the intro if you want it can, uh, can we just like to i i because we're well i hate to do this we're supposed oh, to be yeah. chatting among ourselves but can we bring everyone up to speed who may not know the full drama of like what's going on with your story since since the last time you were on the channel frank when you were still rather <laughs> undercover with what was going on what has happened oh so let's see where to begin um one thing that escalated uh was the frequency and uh, number of emails to my superintendent and all sorts of people in the school claiming I'm a racist, a white supremacist. Uh, they had, I, I obtained some like FOIA, uh, through FOIA, some emails about me where they were talking about, you know, you know, kind of what to do. Uh, they, they'd been kind of cautious though. And I think that was because I built up a, as I built up a social media following, I think it afforded me some protection because they're like, oh, gosh, you know, we don't know what he's going to do. Will he go on and tell about, talk about this? I'm like, yeah, I will. Um, so that kept them kind of quiet for a while, but they did bring me into the administrative headquarters, which is at a separate building, um, over a week ago. And they let me bring a union rep, which I brought a conservative kind of uh, firebrand uh, in our district who was really good. And they gave me kind of this non-specific, vague statement of expectations and why they may have to act. It was kind of like a, this is a non-disciplinary, but totally like pre-disciplinary um, talk. And since then, I got a letter. They've still been kind of quiet. Um, and the letter was, again, you know, kind of this legal answer to my complaints. Um, they had, when I came back from the administrative uh, meeting, they had a sub in my classroom because, you know, I missed the first period of class. And the sub was told by administration to uh, stay for the day in the back. <laughs> It's like, no, <laughs> we, we got, we got that taken care of. Uh, I think they're waiting to see what I'm going to do. Um, you know, they, they think I'm going to, they think they're just like waiting for me to leave. I'm like, nope, we're, we're going to stick this out and, um, not going anywhere for now. So we should start an over under pool on it when they're going to fire you. <laughs> not that I want you to get fired and you know that, but like, you know, I think you're going to get fired. <laughs> yeah. We should yeah. predict it or something. Predicted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think the only saving grace is how incompetent my school district is that they're like, you know, like all things they're behind the curve on, you know, what they need to do. And, uh, I don't think they anticipated how I would respond or the things I would do. Um, I wonder if I, it's a question of bureaucracy too, like the bigger, the bureaucracy, the slower it moves. It just becomes like this very sluggish beast and and you're very nimble you can like jump around and say whatever you want mm -hmm. um, yep mm -hmm. so yeah i think wow. so too yeah i think so too it's um it's interesting paul you know i read uh part, part of the letter paul was 
cracky up last night. I was going through it with them, but I'm just kind of like, at this point, I'm like, the gloves are off. Like if they're going to play games, they're going to, they're going to see, you know, um, how I can be. So I kind of disassembled their, their response was to like try and pretend that they didn't know what I was talking about and they couldn't verify, uh, uh, my complaint. And, um, it was just kind of a like CYA. And so what I did was I replied, um, the, one of my big complaints was that these emails that had gone out to kind of cancel me had been sent to all these, you know, 90 people in the school district and administration was replying all, including my colleagues and, you know, giving out information to this person about. And so I went back to the email and decided, well, let me give my response as a reply all, uh, and include everyone who's been on these. And, uh, yeah. Do you want me to read just like the first, Was that the, did they reply all to the full staff of your school staff, yes. faculty, yep. teachers in the, in, in the school or in the district or the whole district? Well, it was whoever was yeah. included on the email, which I said was, okay. like, you know, I don't know, 90 people, teachers, administrators, okay. wow. board members. And, um, here, I'll just, uh, I'll just read you. I mean, I wrote a long kind of like disassembled their argument, but I will very briefly just read the opening paragraph, how I started this, which I think your uh, audience will like. Um, let's see. All right. I said, dear Miss Vanderbrock, who's the district council, I received in the mail this weekend, what can only be described as a blatantly transparent and desperate after the fact, litigatory prophylactic disguised as a response <laughs> to my HR complaint. I'll give the district credit for the effort, but it was reactive rather than proactive, like most things done by this administration. The email I sent to Human Resources had outlined several complaints about how administrators and board members handled anonymous charges levied against me, specifically the appropriateness of reply all responses disclosing personal information to non-involved parties. In the letter I received, not once was this complaint acknowledged or addressed. I can only assume that this is because the practice of using reply all to address private matters is tolerated. In that spirit, I have decided to embrace this district practice, and what better way to do so than through the email chain that started this fiasco? While I had initially worried that doing so may subject me to disciplinary action, I feel confident that under your guidance, the district would not be so foolish as to discipline staff for behavior permissible by others. Why that would give the appearance of, appearance of impropriety, and I know that this district does all it can to wait on second thought, Avoiding impropriety is not necessarily the district's song, strong suit. Still, if there's one thing they support, it's equity. And I trust that I will be treated equitably. <laughs> yeah, uh, we go from there. So, Well done. We'll see what they say. It's fun, I mean, isn't it? Just to, you know, let it rip. Yeah, well, and one of the things that like I really enjoyed with this whole fiasco with you, Frank, is like you have like, you come out and have start, started pulling like no punches. And that takes balls, man. I'm I'm gonna I'm not gonna lie. It takes balls, <laughs> and and it's just been like it's one of those things that I think that um not enough people do because you have the power position in this scenario. You have the public. You got covered by Bongino, man. Like you're in the power position. You have all the leverage. And I I like wish more people in your position would actually act like they're in the power position because they're res they're totally responsive to you right now. Yeah, it's it's interesting how how I was able to do that, and I think when we last spoke, I uh, I discussed how this was, you know, my tactic or strategy from the beginning was to kind of as quickly as I could gain an upper hand. And sometimes I think people ask, like, why did you create a brand like Chalkboard Heresy? And um, yeah, part of it was, you know, like creating this moniker initially, but then I realized that. To protect myself and to be able to do this, I was going to have to quickly get in a position of power. Um, otherwise, they would just, you know, snuff me out without second thought. So I very quickly focused on doing that, um, kind of, you know, building a base and of supporters and getting my name out there, and uh, it worked. And so, you know, one of the things Paul and I were discussing is, you know, is there a a model? that I've kind of created. I'm not sure if anyone has done it like <laughs> across the country for better or for worse. Is there a model that other teachers can use? I don't know how practical or realistic it is to, to replicate this, but if you're going to do it, if you're going to blow the whistle, you got to come out fast and hard 
and uh, anticipate what they're going to do and be, you know, two steps ahead of them. Well, it's almost like the Project Veritas model, isn't it? I would think like on a, maybe on a smaller scale. But what I mean by that is, um, you know, Project Veritas, every time they have a whistleblower, they have a community of people that's ready to kind of take care of that whistleblower and help that whistleblower. And mm. any time and they immediately send out an email saying, you know, can this person's obviously going to get fired? Can you support their crowdfunding and all this stuff? And you know, one of the things that um, I've been working on kind of quietly in uh, November and December is like, I, I don't know if this is an answer to this or if this is another, like, if there's another answer to this, I think there are probably several answers to this. But like, I've been working on building a website that's going to launch at the very beginning of the year that um, the whole point is I want to try to rally a community to help people who are in situations like this and to be able to distribute information in like, 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 good information not not what's in the conservative media about all this stuff but like good practical information to people and it's one of those things it's like you know there's so many people who have spoken out now that i wonder if you know every time someone speaks out they they you know maybe they can reach out to one of us get pulled into this community and instantly they have a lot of people like me or like you or like paul or like jody shaw or like any anyone else that's done stuff like this that can you know immediately send people their way immediately send at least support if not money um, but at least, you know, emotional support and leverage and try to get them followers and try to get them platformed and all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and if we have like that ready made kind of like response team, maybe that'll make it easier for some people to speak out. Agreed. Yeah, and it's really yeah. important to crowdsource and to, you know, to build on what we know already and not just answer in one off emails. Like I answer a lot of emails about, you know, well, what should I do in this situation? What should I do in this situation? And that, and I, yeah. you know, that's the kind of practical tactical advice that I think like this is this is like happening in real time to you Frank and you're you're putting yourself in the middle of things and learning as you go and all of these things need to be replicated for people so that they you know they can they know what their options are they can understand you know like what's the best tactic in the situation how do I handle this um, mm -hmm. uh, instead of you know what just one-off emails is what I've been doing yeah. I, I mean, and the same with me. It's like I, I spend like half my days answering like random DMs from people saying, you know, this happened in my school or this happened in my workplace. What do I do? And it's like we need to start building a public knowledge base that has all this information that people can go to, because if one person has that question, like probably, you know, a dozen people at least have the same question. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Paul and I have discussed, you know, kind of putting together this, you know, teacher support network. Oh, um, awesome. Because, because awesome. I think it has to be, it has to be led by, you know, teachers or former teachers uh, who, who know the game. There's a lot of stuff out there for parents. There's stuff that connects parents and teachers, but there's nothing really for teachers. Um, I think, um, well, we won't go into it, but I know uh, Fair uh, had this great idea of doing something like that. I don't know where they got it from. Yeah, where did but, they uh, hear that from? Where did Fair know. get that idea from? Huh. Oh my God. I don't know. They I don't know. Yeah. yeah, they're calling it the uh, the Fair Educator Alliance. It's. Uh, huh. I, I had a weird dream about an idea like this, and uh, somehow it was just taken away from me. Yeah. How it was um, snatched. <laughs> yeah. From but, the you know, from the dream state into reality. The, exactly. But, you know, fair isn't that, they're not we yeah, they're not a teacher time. organization. <laughs> yeah, no, I was planning. Yeah. It was a secret. They're not a teacher organization, <laughs> you know, so they don't and they're playing a different game. I think we need um, you know, we also need people too that can speak without these kind of strings attached, um, and can kind of give unfiltered uh messages and support i think that's you know some of these organizations the problem is they're always kind of beholden to the these interests that want them to you know temper their mess and i get that but sometimes you know the message can't be tempered and sometimes it needs to be loud and out there and controversial and um i just hope that my uh you know what i've done and as i continue lead to prod kind of the the hornet's nest uh is kind of instructive conservative as an example i want it to it has to be bigger than than just me and it has to mean something in the end in terms that like people can use it or learn from it or it can demonstrate something you know um it's hard too because it you know this, there's different laws state by state and, and different unions have different protections state by state so it's 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 I know Illinois is a particular, um, you know, it has its own unique 
um, considerations. Is that is that right, Frank? Is the way you described it to me? Yeah, it, they definitely do. Um, each, you know, Illinois is a strong blue union state, but um, I haven't leaned into that um, outside of bringing, which I just thought was good sense. Mm-hmm. You know, it's cheaper than an attorney bringing a union rep with me as a second set of ears. That's not my interest is getting, you know, I could find ways to kind of well, I don't know anymore, but I probably could have found ways to finagle out of this and, you know, utilize all the different union protections afforded to me, but that's not the point. Um, It's, it's about, you know, something bigger, uh, like what, what is, obviously I'm not in this to just try and like save my job and, and move on. Or as I, as I said yesterday, you know, I, if over the past few months, I've had different people reach out to me, you know, like here, you know, here's a job offer, come to this. I'm like, no, like I need to finish this through. Like this is, you know, it, it's, it's a pain. It's, it's stressful. It takes a toll on your health. You know, I sleep probably three to four hours a night now because I'm just like wired up, but, uh, yeah, I don't want to go that route. Um, it's, it would be too easy and wouldn't serve any purpose. I mean, it's got to take an immense psychological toll. I can't imagine like, I mean, I, I, I was teaching, uh, at the end, you know, last spring, Um, But I was not out publicly, like to be out publicly and going to school every day, you know, or go teaching classes. Um, How do you, how do the students respond? Like, how are the students, uh, do they, how much do they know about this or how much is it on their minds? And they've, uh, they've especially recently picked up on a lot. They kind of coincidentally seem to find out right around the time I was pulled into the administrative meeting questions. you know, I, I told him I'm not going into specifics, um, and I explained why. I gave kind of a general little five-minute speech about, you know, standing up for what you believe in and not believing everything you hear, and I that was all I could really do, at least from a, an ethical point of view. I did Yeah, get, you don't want to get him involved, but I, yeah, no. making, a, making just a clear, you know, message statement that, you, yeah. you know, you care just about like, them and... I care about you guys. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, you know, th- this, I can't say this won't affect you in, in some way because, you know, whatever happens to me, you know, that's a consequence. And I know it's been a crazy year for you guys, but uh, sometimes you have to stand up for what you believe in. And I hope that's what you're able to take from it. Uh, I did have one girl who was really, she described herself as um, a, a leftist and she became oh, very wow. political over the pandemic in 2020. And she's going through my Twitter uh, feed, you know, what do you mean by this? Why don't you support LGBTQ teachers? I'm like, what do you mean? Why don't I, su- what do you mean? Who said I don't support them? Well, you know, you pointed out this one teacher, you know, who's going to school in drag. Why don't you support them? I said, because I don't support teachers wearing drag to school. She's like, but that's who he is. I said, there's a lot of things that about me that I can't bring into school. That's part of being an adult. Like, you know, yeah, that gets to like that's a, such a. I mean, for one thing, good for her for for asking yeah. you directly, and like I totally, you know, that's to be again mm-hmm. standing up for what you believe and and bringing it into the, you know, challenging people and asking questions. Um, but it brings up this weird, interesting point, which is there is this movement. I guess it's more like uh, it's more than a movement now. It's a tr- whole trend. Is that you should be able to bring your whole self to school. That the school should be like a place where you're totally comfortable. And you should be accepted, you know, in every aspect of your being, like almost like, and then, and then trying to make the school like a, a substitute family, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, I understand the motivation behind it, but it is a, it is not true. And it is, it is educating kids completely the wrong way about what to expect in life. Like every context, you have to tailor your behavior and what what is appropriate for that context and like you know it's not some horrible ontological violence to ask somebody to be you know to be their best self in a particular situation or to be a particular self which you know as long as it's the same rules for everybody right like Mm -hmm. you can't ask someone to come in um in i guess i would call it like heteroerotic heteroerotic garb right? Mm -hmm. You know, I wouldn't, that would be also horrifying. So like, why, you know, why is it, why is it something that there aren't like, 
certain a certain commitment to a to a particular um, type of conduct or behavior or what is appropriate. Like, why is that? You know, there's a point where that just becomes um, counterproductive. Now, maybe if you're trying to dismantle society and make it into a place where, you know, anything goes, uh, well, then that's that's a feature, not a bug. And I think that's what's actually going on. Yeah. And the yeah. thing of it is, too, with the student asking that question, like the student's logic function of their brain is not fully developed yet. So it makes perfect sense why they might look at a situation and say, oh, well, why why can't they do this? And, you know, and if, if you know, the younger you are, the more like committed you haven't experienced the unfairness of the world yet, like as much as you do when you're an adult. So you might think, oh, it's only fair that people be able to show up as who they really are. But mm -hmm. that's we should expect that thing, those questions to come from students because that's why they're students. I think the problem comes when the adults aren't stepping in and saying, well, here's why it's not a good idea to come to teach a class in drag. And here are the, you know, here are the more appropriate ways to express that. Right. Cause you know, we're, we're not, we're, the, the joke is we're, we're supposed to remain neutral, even though no one does, but like, mm -hmm. you know, don't, you can't give a, you can't give any guidance or feedback or opinions on that. Um, which I think is naive and, I think the irony is that you, the same people that say that are the people that bring, bring in their ideology and other kind of uh, innocuous ways into the classroom. Um, I think she was surprised that I not only let her speak, but then I started encouraging it. I'm like, I said, keep going. I said, you're good. I said, keep going. Like, ask me these questions. Like, challenge me. She's like, well, okay then. And she starts going through and I, I gave her a platform to do so. I, I differ from a lot of teachers on the issue of kind of how to approach, you know, your kind of own political bias. Uh, a lot of teachers, a lot of teachers will say, I never, my students have no idea. It's like, eh, they probably do. Um, so when it, when the time and I deal with, you know, 16 year olds, I'll kind of tell them, I'll say like, guys, here, here are my biases. Here's, I tend to be more conservative. I tend to hold these kind of values and beliefs. And then I set expectations for their ability to challenge me. I said, I, I want you to know I I'm I can be wrong. I said the the opinions I have are not reflective of you know my knowledge as a historian. There's a difference. So just because I may have authority on a position, you know, certain ideas in history doesn't mean that my opinions on teacher drag, for example, are authoritative. I said, they're, they're my opinions, but you're, and I encourage them to challenge me. And then what happens is you have this kind of classroom culture and environment where when your biases do come through, students feel comfortable challenging them. Mm -hmm. And because you can check yours as much as you want, but they're still going to come through. And some students say, oh, Mr. McCormick, like, you know, that's BS. I, I don't buy that, you know, and they're comfortable doing that and you allow it and you encourage it. That to me is a much better method than, you know, I. Uh, I'm not going to tell you who I voted for. Let's do a lesson on systemic racism and how the police are neo-Confederate slave patrol. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, come on. So, so be honest, be upfront, and then you really have to set expectations that they can challenge you. Um, if you're honest and upfront without doing that, then you've kind of uh, put yourself in a position of authority, uh, political authority that's not fair because they may be like, okay, so I know this teacher's a liberal or conservative, but now I can't say anything. But when you make them comfortable with that, especially high schoolers, they will challenge you. They will ask questions and it serves as kind of a safeguard against those times when, you know, you may be giving something in kind of a biased way and you don't realize it. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's interesting. That yeah. I, uh, you ever get, do you ever get students to kind of tell you what you want to hear? Do they ever like appeal to your vanity? And like, I sometimes you get, I kind of had the same approach as you, Frank. And I, you know, you kind of have to have a, I kind of thought I tried to develop a sensitive ear to, to the BS coming from the other side too, or from my side, you know? Yeah, that's, um, they, you will get some students that do that. So what I, I, I do is play devil's advocate and it always kind of surprises yeah. them. They're like, but wait, I'm agreeing with you. I'm like, I know I said, but you don't know, but I said, maybe I'm disagreeing with you. And so that's another way I use to kind of make sure that I'm checking my own bias. If a student says, well, you know, Mr. McCormick, uh, capitalism produces the best outcomes and so on and so forth. I'm like, well, how do you know that? I said, um, does it always produce it? What about this? And I get them thinking. And uh, that's 
that's the way I, I handle it. Someone asked, I saw the things they said, do they have to, do they have to know their teacher's political views? Well, of course not. I just think it's naive to assume they won't pick up on it. Um, and I think it's dangerous to pretend that they don't exist or you don't have them or that you're neutral because then what you do is you establish what you're teaching students as some objective neutral truth that's free of partisanship or ideological bias. And then they're taking that in and being like, okay, so this is the truth. You know, this isn't left wing or right wing. This is just the truth. And it may be complete left wing propaganda, but you've set yourself up as this neutral arbiter of truth. If they at least know that you have this kind of position, they feel comfortable challenging you. They can filter that through and you can help structure that where they're like, yeah, uh, this, this might be a, this might be a biased opinion. I think it's good for our Republic too. You know, we are training students how to kind of recognize if they can challenge their teachers and, and question them and recognize bias coming from their own teacher, then they can do it in with media, with politicians, with other things. So I have, a, that's my justification. People may disagree. I, I get people that disagree with me. I, I was, I, I was honestly thinking the same thing as you were talking. I was like, if we can start from the fundamental premise that maybe school should prepare students to go out into the real world, otherwise, why are we paying for it as taxpayers? Mm -hmm. Then the reality is that regardless of if students graduate and they go on to college or they go get a job or what have you, they're entering a world in which political bias is deeply ingrained into almost every single situation that they are going to encounter for the rest of their life. And mm -hmm. so it's one of those things like, why are, especially if you're teaching them like at the you know middle or getting into like the high school level especially like why are you trying to hide this from them it's something that they're going to encounter and th they should be prepared to identify it and frankly to ask questions and to be able to challenge people that they view in authority authoritative positions agreed absolutely <laughs> i mean that's that should be the the function of um a good education is to prepare students to challenge authority and ask questions. I, I think, unfortunately, while a lot of liberal or left teachers would agree, um, what they see as authority and what I see as authority is different. And a lot of times what they don't realize is that they're, they're telling students question authority as long as it's not, you know, my authority or as long as it's not the established orthodoxy. So when you tell students to, to challenge authority and ask questions, and then your reaction is shock and horror and indignation when they question Black Lives Matter, what have, what have you taught? You know, you're not modeling what you taught. Um, and, and I think it's, it demonstrates they don't really believe that. It's just a nice line for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, Paul, what's on your mind these, minds these days about what's going on in the schools? I've been... Uh... I've been delving through a lot of DEI trainings, teacher trainings, education trainings, Ooh. videos. Um, people have been sending me tons of stuff, and uh, I have gained. Uh, I have. I have renewed my uh, my twisted admiration for some of the sophistication of the social technology that's being deployed. Uh, you know, on children, on kindergartners. And the way it works is all through, like you said earlier, Carlin, you talked about, you know, the natural fairness of kids mm -hmm. and the sense that, you know, of what's fair and unfair. Uh, and they haven't really learned, you know, how some things are unfair. So they, and also they don't want kids to fit into the real world. They want them to change the real world to fit uh, the better world. Isn't so, that interesting? Yeah. Can we just pause on that for a second? They don't want kids to fit into the real world. They want kids to change the world. Right, right. So they, you know, if they create a maladapted person to reality, that's, that's the a, goal. That's a feature, right? So like, that's the goal. And so, you know, and this, um, uh, this is something that goes back to Marx, right? The job is not to understand the world, but to change it. So, so there, this is just the latest you know, incarnation and language around that. And I just watched a video called um, Small Activist, Big Impact about how to teach kindergartners to be social justice warriors and how to use, you know, the presenter is talking about like using the child's natural sense of fairness as a platform, like using their minds. I think that the phrase used was use their minds. Uh, and 
you know, the, the, the schema is really, it's all about, at the beginning, it's all about personal identity. It's about developing a healthy self-concept. This is a lot of where the SEL stuff comes in, um, relating to others, understanding, like they'll do identity work, they'll make identity boxes, identity wheels. And so it's really like about the journey of self-discovery. And this is like fairly benign, right? Or maybe it's beneficial, right? To have a healthy self-concept. Um, there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, in the past, I think there, there has been some neglect of that. So, but once you do that, then you move out outwards into empathy, right? You see everyone else's identity boxes. And then, but then once they have that platform, that's when it gets leveraged in, into, into act, you know, the empathy part, right? So then they start introducing social issues, social problems. Does it seem fair to you that X is happening in the way that they frame it, uh, like frame an issue is, yeah, a social justice issue say is, is the unfairness of this. And, you know, these people, you know, are treated badly. Um, the way they'll talk about stereotypes, like one in this, in this presentation, they showed a picture of an ad for the gap and, you know, the girls wearing pink and the boys wearing blue. And it's, you know, is this, you know, what do you notice about this picture? You know, does this seem okay to you? Right. Then, and, and the sense is like, if, if a preference conforms to a stereotype, well, then that's bad. That's the, that's the message, right? It's, it's, and so it's training the kids to see, to undermine maybe their own preferences or the preferences they hear from somebody else. If they conform to some gender binary, well, then they're bad. That's the, that's kind of the message. Um, wow. So it's, it's pretty sophisticated and you know, everyone, everything is, is like, we got to have a lot of snacks because kids love snacks and they'll spend more time in your office. And, you know, we need boots on the ground. We need kids to, you know, to get other kids to sign up for their affinity groups. So you need to have like kids that you trust to get the other kids to show up. Like they're not, they're not, they're not fucking around. I mean, this is like, this is serious manipulation. And, uh, you know, it's all has the total patina of credentialism and organizational support, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars is flowing into this, like, this is, and it's, and it's going to take, like, this is going to be a massive, uh, a massive upheaval to like dismantle all this. Um, you know, it reminds me, I have this eighth grade class, like uh, the recording of it on this channel, because I have a viewer who like 14 years old was he actually in the class. And so he knew enough to hit record when his teacher started teaching the social justice module in their Zoom yeah. class. And so I have it on the channel and it's literally, it's kind of like what you just described. The teacher starts off with, you believe in the Pledge of Allegiance, don't you? Because the Pledge of Allegiance says fairness and justice for all. Mm -hmm. And if you want things, and we want things to be fair and just, don't we? Because we want our friends to be taken care of. And if you want your friends to be taken care of, then that means we have to do equity instead of equality. Because equity is about just making sure everyone has what they need for what they particularly need. And if we want equity, that means we have to worry about systemic racism because system when systemic racism exists, we don't have equity. And then we have to give these people over here more because it's not fair if we just give them the same amount as people. It, it's like the most nefarious thing ever. And it starts from a positive place of we want everyone to be able to succeed in the world. And then they take it and they pervert it and they make it something, you know, they, they make it something that it was not originally supposed to be. Yeah. And, and again, the implicit message is if someone has less, it's because they've been treated unfairly and someone's taken it from them. Like that's, mm -hmm. there's no disparity without discrimination. So that, that, that is a moral, it becomes a moral imperative to redistribute resources, wealth, you know, access and all. And there's no distinguishing between equality of opportunity and outcome. No. That's the other thing is like, if there's a difference in outcome, well, then there must've been a difference in opportunity. So when you, when I hear people talking about, oh, we need to say it's equality of, you know, it's equality of opportunity. That's not something they even measure. Um, and so, you know, that's a, that's a tricky wicket there. Are schools even teaching anymore the value of showing up and working hard and having a work ethic and, you know, it, because that, that's the difference really between equality of outcome and equality of opportunity, isn't it? It's, it's, do you show up and actually do the thing and try and practice and fail and learn from those failings and get better and show up better next time? Is that something that's even taught in the schools anymore? I don't think so. I think it's actually, you know, for a while it was considered kind of regressive, outdated. Not that teachers didn't do it, not that it didn't still linger, 
but the, there's an effort to fight it by calling that uh, white supremacy culture. Okay. Oh, um, yeah, you know what? I think it's mixed messages. I think I think there are teachers that talk about you know that every everyone kind of knows, even even social justice warrior teachers kind of know that you got to do the work. Um, but they're constantly undermining it with the message that Frank is talking about. It's white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's um, it's actually you know very stressful to push yourself to work harder, um, you know, and that you need you kind of oh you you need the the message of self care is like constantly undermining. So there are a lot of mixed messages floating around, and what that does is it gives it gives both kids and adults a very easy excuse for not working hard. Um, and making it an exogenous problem rather than something that's in them to change that you have the agency to to get a better outcome um and i think that's confusing to a lot of kids and adults too mm -hmm. you know the other thing about with um with sel that's really concerning to me and it's the same thing it's like it's it starts off from a good place like i think that one of the most important things i think that i think that part of the reason all this woke crap has taken over our entire culture is frankly like a lack of personal empowerment and people not having positive self-constructs and not being able like most people can't step into their power the way that frank and frankly you too paul have stepped into your power and have stood up and have said no this is not correct um, most people can't do that because I don't think that they have the positive self-construct and like the self-worth and confidence to be able to say my opinions matter and my values matter and it's okay to say them. And I do think that when we start off with um, social emotional learning in terms of helping young people create positive identities and under like under like uh, you know positive perceptions of who they are, I think that starts off from a really good place. But then when it gets perverted, and you're teaching them that anyone who who adheres to you know the norm, whatever that norm might be, is a bad person, or they just haven't investigated it, or maybe they are you know they're they're kind of like they're outside the popular kids, right? They're out there, they're, they're like the out group of people. If they subscribe to the norm, then you start to take something that starts from a good place and perverts it. My yeah, that's what I mean about the subtlety of and the nuance and and the you know, the grain of truth and, and, and also that's relationship, right? There's the stress on the relationship. Mm -hmm. So the teacher is like, it's not about, you know, teaching knowledge or content. It's about the relationship. So this teacher has a relationship with the student that gives the student an emotional power or valence or that mm -hmm. kind of confidence. And that it's a nurture. It's really just, it's in loco parentis, like, on steroids is what it is. It's it's teachers and bureauc bureaucrats usurping the parental like domain um, in order to you know affect a certain type of change in the world. And and it's it's you really you really can't underestimate that's what's going on. Uh, is it any wonder why you know we're we're having so many issues with student behavior in school and violence. I mean, if, if you're a teenager, would you have respect for these people that are that are teaching you that are like, I want you to have an emotional connection with me and we're gonna use peace circles. And if you swear at me, I wanna know how you felt when you did that. Like, like, I, like this guy's a pushover, like what? Um, and, and I think my, my students definitely, you know, see it that way, uh, especially kind of teaching in a, you know, whatever, an urban, you know, which is kind of a code word for lower class, uh, high population, black and Hispanic, their culture doesn't, you know, see virtue in that kind of soft, you know, softness that exposes the vulnerability of adults. And so a lot of teachers that have, you know, behavior problems in class, it's because they've kind of made themselves vulnerable um, in a way to, I guess, relate to their students, which some vulnerability is okay. Again, there's kernels of truth to all these things, which is why it's difficult to, you know, completely go full against that. Like, yeah, sometimes you should be vulnerable. Sometimes, you know, it's, it is sometimes okay for men to cry and do these things, but the, you know, within reason and kids also need to see strength and mm -hmm. because sometimes through strength, security is created. And um, I grew up with a father who was overly vulnerable. I think it created for a while a lot of uh, 
security issues I had and, and, and I wasn't willing to take risks because the primary male figure I saw in my life was someone who was always scared and seemed at mm. the mercy of life. And what changed for me is I was like, no, you know what? You need to put on your game face. And I think about that as a father and a husband is sometimes like, you know, yes, I want them to see me vulnerable sometimes, but I also want them to see what, what strength looks like. And when things go bad, you need someone in a family or in a classroom to look to and be like, I got this. Things are under control. We're, you know, we're going to, you know, keep your shit together. We're, we, we got this. And that's like, okay, especially as a child, that's encouraging to hear. And I think as a student, when your teacher, Hey guys, I got this. We're all good. You know, don't worry. Everything's okay. I'm in control. I'm in charge. They feel safe. That, that creates safety, not like a teacher, like spilling their guts out and, and, you know, about how weak and vulnerable they are that makes students feel insecure. And then, you know, because if the teacher doesn't have any guts and can't stand up for himself, is he going to stand up to the bullying class? Who's teasing me? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it, it's also, I mean, I think that this is really important. I used to teach this lesson in organizations like all the time. Like, why is the CEO such a hard ass? Well, you know, the CEO may be a hard ass, but at the same time, the CEO is also providing structure for the organization. He's mm -hmm. letting you know that the organization is going to survive through challenges. He's letting you know that there's someone strong at the top who isn't going to take any grief. And would you rather have that or would you rather have someone that's crying in the board meeting saying the world is victimizing? me and there's just nothing I can do about it because I'm so oppressed. Like it just doesn't make any sense when you're in a leadership position and that could be running a multi-million dollar organization or it could be leading a classroom with 30 kids. You know, the people that you are the leader of want you to have strength on some level. Even if sometimes they don't like you exercising that strength, they still, it makes them feel safer that you have it. And I would imagine in a classroom with kids, you know, seeing someone at the helm of that classroom that is strong and saying, you know what, guys, this is my train. We're staying on the rails today. That's going to allow them to, you know, be able to focus on what they should be doing, which is frankly, reading and writing and learning real math, not crazy anti-racist math and like history and the things that they should be learning in school. And the only reason that they're able to focus on those things is if the rest of the stuff around them is taken care of. Yeah, you raised something really interesting there. And, and Frank, like, this this notion of I mean anxiety is proliferating you know this is it's a real it's a national mm -hmm. youth problem at this point and and you know there's this I think there's this there's this real massive trend away from order and structure as a kind of tyrannical thing but you know that really it does help reduce anxiety when you have clear boundaries when you have classroom command I would like not just management but like when you actually have something to say and you can teach information and content in an engaging way, um, I think that's that makes all the difference because it's funny because some of the some of the kids that liked my class, I was really not a good teacher the first few years of teaching. I was I had a lot to learn. I I would, you know, go too far and being a, you know, being like a too too in control and kind of a jerk to like being like too passive and I was like kind of all over the map it took me a while to really find a, a good balance but some you know kids would tell me like that like my class they you know not everyone but some kids would say like you actually we actually you actually teach us things like Mr. Rossi you teach us things I'm like what would your other teachers don't teach you things like what is that like she's like no not really like they'd let us you know, they let us do things and they let us do our own thing. I'm like, well, come on, that can't be everybody. And I think they were exaggerating because I knew that there were teachers that taught them things. But like there's a sense around, especially around student centered learning, that the student is sort of in control and you're there to create a you're just sort of there to create a kind of a structure where they can direct themselves and give them questions. But then you're kind of also subtly directing them. Um, but you, it's, you, it's you very fac passive. Facilitate learning. Yeah, it's a very like passive that. thing. And it's I think the kids feel lost sometimes. Like they'll learn what the they'll learn what the teacher wants to hear and they'll say that to the teacher, but they're not actually like learning cool stuff. Like and I find that, you know, when the teachers that I remember were the ones that knew stuff, they knew how to communicate it in an engaging way, make you think. And they were the kind of teachers that today would be called the sage on the stage, right? The, the, 
the pedant who is, you know, all wrapped up in himself. And it's sort of a caricature of the teacher that's, um, you know, over dominant and, and, and boring. Um, but there's, of course, that's a caricature. That's a stereo, That's a, that's an exaggeration. But those teachers that were just master storytellers, and they could hold you in the palm of your hand and lead you through history, and and make things come alive. I mean, that's that's great teaching. But I think that's kind of a lost art at this point. Mm -hmm. Kind of Definitely. rambling around a lot of things, but um, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> That's how I was. I mean, I was I was really a lecturer and that was where I was at my my strongest. And, you know, in terms of I, I wasn't great at, um, at facilitating these kind of overly complex activities, you know, and, and I just felt like it was a, there was an opportunity cost, you know, the amount of time it took to do like, let's do a jigsaw activity where students break into, you know, 13 different groups over a period of you know, three minute increments and are sharing. I'm like, yeah. God, you know, it's the not camp to me to do that. Right. pedagogy. It's just ridiculous. And yeah. so I, I always had fun when I had like my formal observations, which I always did very well on challenging the evaluators. It was kind of risky, but at the same time, it was also what I was good at. So I was like, well, it can't be that risky, but they'd be like, you know, you can't, a principal to you, you can't do 45 minutes of like direct instruction or mostly direct and that won't work. Students will, I was like, just watch They're Like, well, okay. It's your evaluation. And they'd almost always come back like, okay. Like, wow. I was, you know, students really engagement was like pretty high the entire time. And they were surprised. I'm like, it's just how you do it. It's, yes, you know, this exactly. idea of, um, and, and I admit direct instruction is hard. First of all, it takes, you're doing it five hours a day. It's draining. So it's not something that, you know, I think is realistic all the time, but, um, when you do it well, it's incredibly effective, but it's also hard. I mean, most adults, you know, you look at like corporate training and adult education. I, I watch some of these things. I'm like, man, would have killed you to like put together a little bit more style into like your PowerPoint just to increase engagement because those things matter. I know they're not supposed to, but there's a, you know, when students see something visually engaging, when any of us do, we're, we're drawn to it. It captures our interest. We're more likely to listen. And there's a lot that goes into it, but when done well, it's, I think, direct instruction uh, mixed with, you know, Socratic methods yeah, of right. questioning. Mm -hmm. It can't just be droning, but it has to be a, what I call dialogues you have a dialogue in your classroom, it's ongoing throughout the lecture, that can be probably the most powerful uh, way of learning. That's probably the the oldest and most time tested. You're having a conversation with people, you're sharing information, they're challenging, they're questioning, it's a process, you share more information. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. A lot, I think a lot of people think they've made education overly complicated because one, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of money in it and kind of trying to apply these scientific, yeah. mm -hmm. there's these scientific rules and principles that makes people feel like it's somehow more elevated. Um, but, you know, I, I never felt that this isn't complicated stuff. It, it can be difficult. Uh, it can require a lot of creativity, but it's not overly complicated. Um, and if you, you think it is, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, well, I think that's kind of our culture, though, isn't it? It's like we get a new phone every couple of years. We get a new computer every couple of years. The technology advances like everything around us is replaced all the time. We buy like almost everyone buys clothing that is purely meant to be worn for maybe like a short period of time and then thrown away and replaced with something new because it's all so cheap and made in India that we can do it all the time. And it's like I think a lot of people just have the sense that if you replace one thing, one of the, another thing, the thing that you're replacing it with is inherently better than the previous thing. When in fact, no, it may just be that we got, we have in massive cases of ADD in our society. Mm -hmm. We decided we needed a new thing. And oh, isn't it great that we're feeding an entire industry of people <laughs> who are paid money specifically to invent, regardless of whether or not there's proof that it actually works, what the next big thing is, and then get paid massive amounts of money by the taxpayers to implement the, implement the next big thing in the school district with absolutely no evidence of whether it works or not. Yeah, it's like the Simpsons mm -hmm. monorail episode over and over again. Like somebody walks, <laughs> around, walk, comes into town and like, don't you remember being bored in school? Like, well, we got this new way of doing like, and it's such an opportunity and there's so much of a gravy train. Um, and you know, no one ever, and at five years it'll change and it'll be the same, uh, warmed over crap in a different package. 
but you know, I admit you reminded me of this this picture that they always say, you know, the factory model of education, and they have all the desks and the teacher at the front, and they say this was this was set up, you know, because they needed good workers to work in the factories. I'm like, no, like mm-hmm. maybe, but and also like we kind of made a lot of progress in the 20th century intellectually. Right. Like, right. Did, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't not working. Uh, and it wasn't just creating workers. I mean, um, you know, there are exceptions like Einstein got a D in science or whatever, but but it had incredible, it was incredibly uh, powerful. And and that model of education had incredible success. So I don't even Paul, know what they're Paul, arguing against. Factories are bad. Factories are bad. White factories supremacy. Bad. I, um, I, the, the, Thanks, the only things I purchase, yeah, organic, locally sourced, <laughs> handcrafted um goods that are 300 times the price of what the peasantry pays but that is yeah. the way that's the way to shop everything handcrafted i hate factories Ma- I mean, <laughs> mass production mass production bad i know i like that they say like it's the factory model of education like well maybe because factories are pretty damn efficient man like i don't know what to tell you i'm not you know i'm joking but uh i think a lot of these uh, you know i've kind of this thought experiment i've been thinking about where i i really wish you could test people's commit like do, do people really believe this like in their heart of hearts they believe this is the best way to teach and that these are the best ways to run a school and so i think about like the world ends and you got kind of two camps you have kind of the left-wing DEI teachers, two teachers, and they say, yeah, just come with us. We're going to be doing like culturally responsive farming and X, Y, Z. And then you got Paul and I, and we're like, we're doing like classical, traditional ways of farming, and we're doing a more strength-based traditional approach. Like who, who do you go with if your actual survival was on the line? I, I don't know. I don't know what culturally relevant farming would look like, but I imagine it would end with starvation (laughs) well you know what's funny though is i'm thinking right now about like all those kind of like gentrified hipster communities that Mm -hmm. are kind of like going back and doing things like the old way but it's like they're doing in like an incredibly hipster way so it seems like they're being like new and all this stuff but they're really just doing things like the old way and then packaging that and it's kind of it's funny that to think that you know you guys are doing you guys are doing the old hipster style version of it you two might as well grow like twiddly mustaches right now or something because like that that's basically what we're talking about. It's like you're going back and you're doing it like the old school way, the time tested way, the way that worked, the way that has more. I mean, if we think about, you know, I was I was in London like a month ago and I was going to all these museums and just looking at like all this old stuff. And I was like, one of the things that was striking to me was like the amount of craftsmanship and work and thought that goes into everything. And it's kind of it's the same with anything, right? Like when you do things the old way, there was much more thought and effort. And it wasn't this mass produced kind of thing that was just churning out, a, you know, useless plastic crap. It was actually built to last a lifetime. And it kind of strikes me that like you guys are thinking about education in the same way. If that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. One of the one of the problems of that everyone who's want trying to make a buck in the education market is is always comes to realize is that it doesn't scale very well. Like education is something that just it's it takes care, it takes like people and it takes like a, people with who are very committed to the you know to, to kids learning and they and that is a very difficult thing to replicate and scale. And so you have, you know, I got an, ed- I got a master's degree in educational psychology and they were always, you know, they hate teachers because they're like, well, if you just did the thing this way, that the, the right way, every time we'd have great success because that would match the experiment. But what I, once I started teaching, they were mad at me because they, when I became a teacher, they were like, you've, you know, you're a trader. You're supposed to believe you're supposed to, you're here for research. I was like, no, I want to teach. Uh, but then you get into the, to the, into the thick of it and you're like, no, this is actually, this is about you know, this place with these kids and, and you can use some of the same material, but I would constantly have to reinvent my class. And, you know, it, it's a, it's just not a thing that scales well. And I think mm-hmm. that's actually one of the good things I like about it. You know, I want to bring in this um, chat from a uh, super chat from dragon water. And then Frank, you can respond as well to this or whatever. Um, dragon water said a standard set of rules would also help when every teacher has a different set of rules and it, they enforce, it doesn't help. And I think the point, and, and I understand dragon water's point here. and I understand why he's making it. Um, but it's also like, I think for some people, 
they they really value that consistency. And for some people, it's going to be really disruptive when they go from classroom to classroom and teachers are doing things differently. But I think to the point that you just made, Paul, that education is a personalized thing for other students. It's not going to be as disruptive. And so I think, you know, you know, is it is it that is it a crazy idea that we need to look at students as individuals and not as affinity groups? Yeah, or a preconceived notion of what their identity, what's the most important thing about their identity? Mm -hmm. You know, their social, their, their socially imposed identity. Um, you know, every, every, every child is like, you know, the all seeing, all dancing crap of the world. I mean, you have to give them, give them the, the tools to, to, to be themselves in, but like as a, as an independent agent um, who can do great things, you know, working with other people, but like, uh, somebody's just like kind of letting them come to their own realizations and I don't know, doing what they can with what you have to teach them. It's dangerous to let students come to their own realizations though, isn't it? Because then you can't control where they go. Well, they have to have a critical consciousness, but they have to be critical of all the right things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they can't be critical of the thing of the consciousness that we're trying to impart them to itself. Which just goes back to what Frank was saying, which was, you know, to, if you pretend you don't have biases, I mean, it, it's so ironic because the critical consciousness means find the biases in the media that everyone that's lying to you. Um, but I'm not, but like, but I'm not lying to you. Mm. Right. I mean, that's, that's a scary. I'm a telling scary you the truth. Thing, everyone right? else is lying. And this is, you know, that's objectivity to them. It's like the objectivity of the necessity of social justice. Um, and a particular program and agenda that, that it requires. And that is unquestionable, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can, you can manage it. You can, there's a little wriggle room there, but you can't question the premises. Like when I questioned the anti-racist premises, I was an anti, I am an anti-racist. When I questioned the anti-racist premises, they said I was questioning the anti-racist goals. Mm -hmm. And there's this whole sequencing thing going on there where they, there's a, sleight of hand where if you question our premises then you must not care about where we want to go no like no i care you know i just have different premises than you but i want to i have i have the same you know i believe in like a better world um i don't know it's a very it's a very tricky interesting thing it's such um, yeah i mean the whole the whole idea about like because we want the same thing that means that you should be on board with kind of like my way of getting there is just preposterous um I'll, I'll give you a really controversial spicy example okay you have two uh two adults and they both agree that they want children to feel good okay and we say hey we have the same goals man we want children to feel good. Oh so, no! So let's get there. <laughs> oh. And you got one person who is uh, working with them to develop their self confidence, and one person who's giving them crack cocaine and porn. Well, they have the same goals. So why? So you know why wouldn't you support my model? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And at that point, you know, you're you've lost the plot you're you know you but i think that's actually a very good example because it is you know it is a kind of instant <clears throat> gratification um mm. and also the external like find your you know find your worth in a collective find your worth working with other people and you know that's you're kind of always looking externally for your identity and how people are treating you and how you're could be quote unquote harming people um and it's it's a very yeah, it's the classical model of education is like you know look within like if you have something to say the truth is missing from this conversation you have a duty to bring it to light and if it hurts you know if you if, if you are serious if you're not just being a troll but you're really serious about what you have to say you have you are duty bound to bring it to to bring it to the floor you know and you know the harm be damned like it's just words ultimately and so like we need to cultivate that kind of tolerance you know in the in the mechanical sense and like the you know the axle of the of the car that doesn't break when it hears things that that make it feel bad you know that's that's real tolerance um you know because 
we're not all going to love each other. Like that's just a pipe dream. Uh, you have to be able to will it. You have to be. You have to understand how to exist in the world where people won't like you, and they won't accept you, and they won't, you know, treat you like the like the precious flower that you are. So, like, what do you do? Mm -hmm. You know, I was thinking about this uh, like a week or two ago about these people who are like, you know, you're denying my existence. You're denying my existence. Well, I think what's really happening is they're denying their existence or they're not accepting who they really are on some level, but they don't want to do the work for lack of a better term of looking in the mirror and saying you know what like there's something that i need to come to grips with about myself and instead of doing that they're trying to blame every single person around them for not accepting their existence well why does it matter to you what i think of your existence or what the guy down the street thinks of your existence if you're comfortable with your existence and who you are then that should really be all that matters at the end of the day. Because in life, you're going to encounter a lot of people that don't like you. Not everyone's meant to be best friends. And, you know, if you don't have that comfort in yourself first, then it, it, it frankly, it does not matter what anyone else thinks of you. So, you know, accept your own existence first and stop worrying about everyone else. That's true. Um, yeah, I mean, people want to be validated regardless and I, and I don't understand that. I mean, this idea of like, you, you know, you're denying my existence. Like, yeah, maybe I am. Like, if you say so, I mean, if, if your existence is predicated on me believing certain goofy things, then yeah, I am denying that because I'm not playing that. You know, if I, if I, if I told you I'm, I'm the, uh, God of, uh, muffins. Okay. And, um, you say, no, you're not. Well, muffin God, you're, uh, well, you're denying my existence. I am yeah. the God of muffins. Come on. You know, every morning, um, I command muffins into existence through baking and that is my lived experience. And that is who I am. And who are you to deny that you're saying you, that muffin I don't God. exist. You're yes. I'm saying you don't exist. I'm saying there, you know, so, uh, like, I think people don't, we, we've gotten so used to like playing these games though, and like not giving honest responses that people are shocked and outraged as almost these kind of this automatic response. Like they haven't thought it through. So it's like, well, are you saying you're against this? And when you say like, yeah, I am. And, and they're like, huh. well, you're right. I'm like, yeah, I know I'm a racist white supremacist. I got that. You're bad. What, yeah. What, you're a bad person. What, I'm bad. But the muffin example is like almost a perfect example for this because like if you are the god of muffins and you bake several dozen muffins every single morning and your house is filled with glorious, glorious muffins, then who the fuck cares what anyone else thinks of yeah. you? Right. Who cares what anyone else thinks of your muffins? You're like, I'm surrounded by muffins, man. I'm cool. Would um, a muffin god care? Like, oh, nobody believes I make the muffins. No, no a muffin, muffin god is a god. Muffins. It's a god. <laughs> yeah. be a, actually be a god then. You know what I mean? Look, I, I drink God. I drink two cups of coffee every morning and I take my Adderall and for about three hours, I feel like I am the God of muffins. So who who, who else cares about that? I feel good about myself. I'm empowered. There's, I'm there, up. There's this expression. I don't know who came up with it, but it's big in DEI training circles called windows and mirrors. Uh, and I think in SEL too. And the idea is that like other people are your mirrors, like they reflect your identity and you get to know yourself by seeing yourself. And it's a, it's a deeply narcissistic thing with the mirrors, but they're also windows. So like, oh, they're different than you can like learn and like explore other people. But it's, it's all outer directed. It's all like who you, you know yourself and you through like out there like in the world mm. it's like you get it's driving kids out into the world we really should be like go in like you know ask yourself this question and then wait and then see what you actually think like not the easiest first answer but like what do you really think mm -hmm. you know i think that's a that's a much more um you know socratic dialogue reflective thing rather like i would tell you like don't pay any attention to to the other kids <laughs> i mean that's what a, that's what actually a parent will do it's like don't listen to those other idiots mm -hmm. like you're you know you're special you're insert last name here like that that was the job of the family that is being usurped I and mean, it all goes back to like 
the state telling you who you are, the state managing the identity of children. Um, and that's why, mm -hmm. you know, that's why we're in very dangerous ground. Let me let me ask you this on, on that note, because I had a chat with Deb Philman, um, yeah, I think several months ago at this point, where we were talking about how the like American model of education is based on like the Prussian model, which is basically to mold little beings that will be in service of the state. Um, do you two agree with that? Uh, look, I I tend to shy away from arguments that give I, I don't know kind of um, an agenda or a cause to forces. I'm not sure that um, necessarily possess that. I think it's sometimes easy to you know. I, I think a lot of this stuff happens just through the way ideas work and get reinforced. And I, I'm not sure that, you know, sometimes people be like, SEL, this is part of their Marxist agenda to do this. I'm like, okay, I may agree that that it does the things you say and that it's harmful for the reasons you say, but who, who is they? Like, mm. uh, it's it's the same way with like racism. They're like, yeah, this is also, you know, part of their racist goal. Like, who's racist goal? Like, yeah, sometimes racism just occurs organically and it reinforces itself and we get that. But, and I think the same forces are at play here. Um, I think there's sometimes when you can say like, yeah, they actually, they do have an ideological, uh, agenda underlying this and these are their goals, but, but I try not to take that too far. Um, meaning like, do I think they're trying to undermine the Republic? Like maybe some, I don't know, maybe some teachers are, but I, I just, I don't see that as, as convincing and I don't, you know, unless you have a specific example. And I also think too, sometimes when we say those things, it makes, it can turn people off because it starts to sound conspiratorial. Um, I agree with that. I, I, agree and with I just, that. I don't know. I don't see it. Like, it was, you know, I, I don't know. Like it's, it, you know, teach, it's a Marxist agenda. I see how, like, okay. It may be Marxist influence yeah. and it may have those outcomes, but, uh, but I'm not necessarily sure that that's the reason people are doing it. And, and I, I want to I, I want to say real quick why I agree with the conspiratorial thing because I want to make sure I'm I'm very clear. I absolutely do believe that there are people who have that agenda. I also believe that you know I, I've said mm -hmm. to people I was, I'm like I'm sure that every single person who knew me before like the last couple of years thinks I've become like a raging conspiracy theorist, mm -hmm. and I'm also mm -hmm. absolutely positive that everything I'm saying has at least some basis in reality, if not being completely grounded in reality. So it's like I know I sound like a conspiracy theorist, but I'm also pretty sure that I'm right. But I mean, to your point, Frank, it's like I don't necessarily believe that every teacher is a Marxist and is trying to to destabilize the system to integrate a Marxist utopia. I think there are great teachers. I mean, I was just at a school board meeting last week where, um, you know, the school board didn't like me very much. But the fact is that there were a whole bunch of teachers there that were really pissed off at the school board as well. And so it's like, I do think that there are a lot of teachers that are you know, kind of getting a bad rap when they're just trying to be teachers. They just wanted to do their go in and do their jobs and they're struggling with what's going on as much as anyone. Um, so I do think sometimes it does sound a little, my point is I do think that sometimes it sounds conspiratorial. And I do think that sometimes people make the assumption that every single teacher ever is involved in the conspiracy when they're not. Most of them are not. I do think there is a small percentage of useful, not even useful, like people like Randy Weingarten, who absolutely understand what's going on, but mm -hmm. most people don't. It's so funny. They actually, I'm, I'm kind of with you, Carlin. Uh, the transformative is the adjective of SEL, right? Transformative SEL. What are they transforming? Mm -hmm. What do they want to transform it into? They want to make this better world. That's it's a t disrupt and dismantle. This is like the, the essence of it, at least at the curriculum. Like you said, they're individual teachers. They're even good teachers. Um, but I mean, the, when the word co-conspirator is actually a positive in the literature, in in what they're teaching kids, the same the same video I just watched was teaching kindergartners to be co-conspirators. Wow! Like they want that language that that was like one of the buzzwords they were going to hammer in this in this thing. And this is not just this is taught. This is being presented by an actual teacher who does teach this to kids. Um. So like. You know, you, it's it's clear to me that this is, uh, you know, that this is the real deal. Now, I think the word conspiracy is misleading because it makes you think that there are people like rubbing their hands together. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna do this bad stuff. No, they they are worse 
they they believe they're doing good stuff like they are fully committed to like and there's millions of dollars behind it and there's foundations behind it and there's money pouring into these companies and you know building careers and that they are true believers um you know maybe there's maybe it's a grift for some people but i don't think for most people like they are the i think it can both right. be a grift and be true believers i think both mm -hmm. those things can be true frank go ahead sorry Oh, that's fine. Yeah, I was just saying, I think, uh, Paul, what you're on to is is correct in that a lot of times the designers of these things do have kind of very specific mm -hmm. ends they're trying to see through. Uh, maybe my, uh, where I get a little fuzzy is when people start talking about, you know, that like all these teachers are in on it. Um, I think oh, a lot yeah, of the right. teachers, they just, they just follow what the design has been established and they have good intentions. Um, someone said, I, I just saw in the comments, they said, uh, this man needs to see libs of TikTok. There are genuine recordings um, about activists. Oh, I get He's that. familiar. I, I know. <laughs> I no, believe me. I do recognize, and I don't think it's a conspiracy to say that you have many teachers, probably a majority, that see it as their job to turn students into liberal-minded activists. I don't see that. That's not what I'm talking about when when I mention the conspiracy component. I'm talking about when people say that teachers are using culturally relevant pedagogy as a way to destroy the family unit i'm like like okay maybe i don't know culturally relevant pedagogy does those things uh, as a consequence but the idea that like there's teachers that are like going to the classroom and and tell themselves uh like yeah God, here's the day i'm going to destroy the family and it's just, <laughs> and maybe yeah, maybe it's because I came from, you know, my over a decade in public education as I shifted, um, you know, across the ideological spectrum. I'm, I, I kind of know I'm like, yeah, I, I was in. I, I'll, I'll tell you what it was like and, and how we thought. Or it's possible that I'm just projecting because, you know, sometimes we do that. We assume that everyone else thinks and acts like us. So maybe because I didn't have malicious intent and i wasn't acting with malfeasance that um i'm assuming other people aren't doing the same and maybe they are i don't know i, don't I know. think it's actually more nefarious when people don't really understand the logical outcome of what they're teaching to be honest i think it's i i think it makes it it makes it actually a bigger problem to solve if the majority of teachers that are teaching this stuff do not think it through to understand like oh if this keeps, if we keep going with this, this is where we're going to end up. And they're just coming in and handing out the worksheets and doing the things they're told to do. And maybe they, they have no nefarious intent and maybe that, you know, all that's true. And I, I do actually do believe that, but I think that that's actually a bigger problem to solve than a massive teacher conspiracy led by the teachers unions and the schools of education to indoctrinate the youth of the nation. Because at least if you have something that's that overt, you can prove it a lot easier and you can expose it a lot easier. But, you know, I, what I think everyone in this chat right now is trying to do is expose something that teachers might be acting as useful idiots and accomplishing when they don't even realize what they're doing because they haven't taken the time to think it through. And again, I want to say, like, I understand that, like, teachers are busy, man. Like, they got a lot going on. And so, and, and, you know, as someone who lived their life completely checked out from what was going on in the world for years, I absolutely understand how that can happen. But I do think it makes it a tougher problem for people like us to unravel when we're trying to say, no, 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 this is really happening and we need to start paying attention to this. Does that make any sense? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, teachers are living, they're kind of living in their own mott, like the mott Bailey, like they believe the mott, like they think that's mm -hmm. what they're doing. And we're just trying to, you know, make kids care about each other and care about the world. And don't you want kids to care about the world? Um, but yeah, it's almost worse because that's just kind of a, that's just a kind of stupidity, frankly. Like that's scarier to me. Mm -hmm. um, like you should think about that if you're a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, because, I mean, just have some humility around virtue, your own virtue, right? Like virtue pushed to extremes is becomes vice, right? You could be, you could have the most virtuous ideas. And when you, if you implemented them fully, you'd be a monster. Um, you know, if you, if you enforced it on everyone, um, so just have a little humility in what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I don't know. 
I like this comment. When I was a child in the DARE program, they literally tried to get to sell our parents' drug or alcohol use. Now teachers are literally telling kids to lie to their parents. <laughs> Isn't that See, funny? That's, that's a conversation I need to have with my son. We don't talk about the little white baggies that daddy, <laughs> daddy pours on the table and <laughs> a dollar bill. It's just a kind of nice kind of sugar. Yeah. I'm the muffin god. It's just muffin, muffin god sugar. God needs his, needs his uh, motivation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do remember oh, that. Though. I remember they, they, that was uh, one time when I felt kind of positioned against my parents when they would talk about, I grew up in a uh, Australian family and then my dad's French. So, you know, drinking and smoking were big parts of what I was exposed to and, and were far more normalized than uh, in American culture. I mean, I, you know, used to have uh, small glasses of wine with dinner in second grade for my French grandfather, because that was what we did. And smoking was just, you know, not a big deal. Um, and so I remember when they would come in and they talk about this stuff, you know, like alcohol and tobacco or drugs. And if you do this, you're drug. And I remember thinking like, God, my parents are drug addicts. And they were, of course, furious. You know, I mean, I, I think their argument was the same people trying to, this was, you know, 20 years ago, they're like the same people trying to, you know, normalize pot or telling us that, you know, you know, smoking a cigar or whatever, or drinking, you know, two glasses of wine a night is, is drug use. And um, I, I do remember feeling like very conflicted about that. And, and um, that was intentional. I mean, they were trying to establish something and I'm not sure what exactly the, 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 the purpose of that was by creating that tension between their kids and their parents for something that's pretty socially acceptable. I mean, most people drink to some degree. And mm -hmm. I, I think um, telling kids that kind of stuff or anything about their parents, you know, that if their parents don't support X, Y, or Z, it means they're bigoted. I mean, that's just, that's just terrible. Um, people, people have a right to have their own beliefs and opinions. And that's a conversation for a parent to have with their child. If their child one day wants to ask, why don't you support this thing? Maybe they do decide their parent. Maybe their parent is a bigot. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not the school's job to be, you know, kind of deciding how students should uh, morally assess their parents, especially because schools are in no position to do that, especially teachers. Like the last, the last place I want telling my kid what's moral and just is, is this place. Um, yeah, what I worry about the most is really is this naive conflation of the community and what's good for an authentic community with the state. That is this idea that the state is the community and that, mm -hmm. oh, well, they just, you know, social programs will just help people be, it'll help the community. And there's this just, there's no, I think that that was the scariest thing I saw with the kids and with the teachers that there was no um, recognition, you know, that those things were very separate and like to have it what's good for a community like an authentic community where people you know help each other is um you know, that's that's what needs to change like if you want to have actual lasting change not this kind of you know we're from the government we're here to help the greatest trick the teachers unions ever played was convincing the public that teachers are not government employees <laughs> 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 i want to bring great. in this super chat from emily l and frank i know you're a history teacher so this is a great one um my mom teaches you or my not mom teaches high school history she's conservative but worried about consequences what are things she can say slash do to help reinforce good ideas and not damaging ones well it's a tough so i'm assuming that she's worried about what would you take that to mean consequences of um, not towing the 1619 project oh, line, stuff okay. like that. I would assume. Look, it, it's a difficult conversation um, to have with teachers. And I have this a lot with teachers that message me like, you know, I, I want to speak out, but I'm not ready, but I have this. And I kind of think that you can find all the excuses in the world and you can do this for the rest of your life. Or you can decide that today's the day you speak up and say no more. And people think that I am somehow like 
maybe people don't think that maybe I'm just projecting, but I would assume that some people think like, well, yeah, but it's different because you have now a smaller following and so forth. But that's not how this began. And I certainly did not know that's where this would lead. And I was certainly, um, you know, this decision came from a very oddly kind of like a dark place just for me personally, just a bad year and, and feeling I had to kind of like to a degree reinvent myself. And I think that was part of it. And um, I, I think without those, that kind of dark period of my life, I wouldn't have been able to assess what I was doing and what I was going to like, you know, where my line was. And, um, but I, I had to say that to myself, if not now, when um, we all have, you know, hostages, we give the world, look, I have a son. I don't, you know, I have debt and I don't have a savings account. Like what, <laughs> there's, there's, uh, I, I got a lot on the line here, but at the end of the day, like, you got to have some confidence in yourself. And I think a lot of teachers don't, they think that like, this is the best I'll ever do. I'll never get a job anywhere. I think that happens as a, I've spoken about that as the, I think public schooling can kind of break teachers down too, because it's so neg, it can be so negative and so toxic. Teachers start to believe it. It's they approach T, you know, the administration approaches teachers from a deficit model. So you start to believe you're a bad teacher, a bad person, a bad worker, and that this is the best job you'll ever get and you better cling to it. And um, when you realize that's not true and you kind of break that illusion, you're liberated to then act without that fear of, of one job or one career. And then you can start to speak out. And maybe that's what scares them. Um, so yeah, if not now, when? I, I would also add that, you know, I've, I said this recently on Twitter. I said, if you think that it's difficult to stand up to these people now. You wait till they have a little more power. You wait till they have guns. Mm -hmm. Then you'll see. Then you'll see what difficult looks like. This is the easiest time in that the, there's going to exist to stand up to these people. It's only going to get more and more difficult. Mm -hmm. Just the truth. So if you can't do it now, get used to living on your knees because it's not going to be any easier. And you better get used to being silent then, because I guarantee you, you won't do it, you know, when there's more severe repercussions for speaking out. And so that's what I would say. Have that conversation. It has, there has to be, it, it can't just be like a calculated decision. It has to be like kind of a, a moral awakening um, that has to go on inside you and you have to see the bigger picture. It's kind of like, you know, the matrix. You kind of see it for what it is. You see where this takes us. You see the risks of being silent and then there's no question about it. Mm -hmm. Paul, what do you think? Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that there, I think Frank's right. I think you, you, you gotta, you gotta speak out. Um, you know, get, don't, don't, I mean, learn the, learn the, whatever the laws of your employment are, you have to understand your risk tolerance and everything. And, <clears throat> you know, I think on a practical level, there's, there are approaches you can do that will get some, engagement in the classroom around questions. I mean, one thing I've, I've you know, I, I think I did this once and it, it was kind of interesting, like diversity, inclusion, equity, these are like transcendental virtues at this point. Like they cannot be questioned. They are not, they are at best, like they are good, but they're secondary virtues. They're not like the most important thing um, in my in my view. So you can sometimes challenge people and say like, well, you know, what, what is too much diversity? Like, is there such a thing as too much of a good thing? Hmm. Um, what is, have, you know, what would that look like? Just, I mean, you engage their imaginations and understand that certain things have a threshold where they, you know, to, because that's just an unquestioned assumption all the time. Um, and just get them to think about it. the other thing you can do is if you're teaching the 6019 project and you want to have some diversity of views you can you can actually give a steel man you know really give a good other side um where that challenges this directly so you can actually have criticism of the 6019 project and then you can sell it if, if they push back and you can sell it to the administration as like well what i needed to to show them and you know its value compared to other points of view you know there's you can usually i mean test it out but like you can kind of maybe give them a little something um 
outside the norm. You know, it's not like you just have to teach this one thing a lot of times. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, These are two things I thought of, but. Hmm. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Uh, gauging imagination is is really frequently interesting. Like I did that with the D with the DEI czars at my school. Like I would say, well, what's your what's the goal? Like where what's the paradise that we're all that you would imagine? Like what's a world of social justice? And they would talk about it like, well, it's just a place where people have more than somebody else. They'll just give it to the person. You know, they'll just give it, and then we'll we won't need to manage people people's behavior. They'll just give it of their own volition. I'm like, well, who's gonna enforce that? Who's gonna like make sure? Who's gonna build? First of all, who's gonna make the stuff? Who's gonna the stuff that people are giving away? Who's gonna make it? Robots. This one, this one lady said, like, well, robots. Will make wow. It. And I was like, well, who's gonna make the robots? You know, like you get, you can, you can actually get into these conversations where the defenses are down because they're not, they're actually dreaming. They're, 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 they're kind of lost in the dream, and you can really get get into their minds. I don't know. I, I, I think that there's a lot more room for exploration and, and an engagement with people if you just sort of befriend them. So, I, you know, I like people. I liked the people in my school that were these, you know, everyone thinks of as these crazy people. And in many ways, they had crazy beliefs, but they were nice people. They were accessible. They were friendly. Talk about the coffee machine, you know, meet them with a smile. Um, you know, you, you can get into a conversation that's, that's interesting and a productive sometimes i mean it doesn't you're not you're not going to change their minds or anything but at least you can see clearly what they're thinking you know as you were describing that what i was thinking was um how you know people always think that if you have a lot of money it's great and maybe maybe someone wins the lottery right well what happens when when someone who maybe um like wins the lottery suddenly has a lot of cash they didn't have before all the deadbeat relatives start showing up and they start putting out their hand and being like, ooh, like, what do you have for me now? In a much nicer way, of course. But they do show up and they start asking for stuff that they haven't um, done anything to acquire in any way, shape, or form. And so, like, what you just described in terms of, like, <clears throat> we live in a fair and just world where if someone has more than another, they just willingly give it over. It's like you're literally describing a world in which you are trying to encourage the deadbeat relatives to continue to be deadbeat relatives and asking for handouts instead of teaching the deadbeat relatives that, you know what, do go buy a lottery ticket, go, or even, even better than a lottery ticket. Cause we should all, no, no one should be depending on the lottery for their, you know, life choices. Mm -hmm. um, like, you know, go out, build a business, like work hard, show up. I don't think that it's ever an enabling thing to be relying on handouts from other people in order to live your life. Now, there, there are times in our lives when, for sure, like we, we all could use a little charity and a little grace from others. And I think that, you know, that that charity and that grace should be available for people when they are really in those circumstances where they need it. But if we're talking about just, you know, teaching people that, you know, that that they shouldn't have to work for things, that it should just be handed to them, whether it be by the person who has more money or the government or anything else, I think that that puts people at a fundamentally disadvantageous position that really tells them, you have no control over your life. You have to rely on other people. And I kind of think it's the same thing with, um, you know, social justice, critical race theory being taught in the classroom, especially when we're talking about younger kids. It's like, you know, you're literally teaching young black kids that they cannot achieve in the world unless white people allow them to achieve, it puts them at a fundamentally disadvantageous position. And I think it's frankly child abuse to teach someone else that your success in life is entirely dependent on this race of people over here, most of whom you will never actually meet in your life. What do you guys think? I agree. I um, sometimes flip it, you know, when people talk about how, well, you don't understand, you know, white people make it difficult to do these things and prevent us from opportunities and have control. Um, that's my live ex lived experience. That's what I've witnessed. That to me is like the, the left's version of when you go to, and I'm not trying to generalize, but if you mm -hmm. 
Um, but I will anyway, <laughs> when you go to like a, a, you know, a, a rural white town and you find the guy who's like, Hey, you know, the immigrants came here. They took my job. They took everything from me. They took my education and I've been unemployed for 12 years. Cause of that I'm like, really dude, like the, the, you know, illiterate Honduran teenager took your job. Like I, it's not to dismiss that immigration doesn't have consequences and stuff. I'm just saying like. At some point, at what point are you going to stop blaming others? I would say the same thing when people yeah. talk about, you know, white people did this and they came into this town, my land, like, okay, like bad things happen. At what point are you going to stop blaming white people? So I, just stop blaming people un unless there's like really a clear causal link and it has caused you significant amounts of harm and in specific instances. But even then, after a certain point, it, it becomes toxic. It just... Even then, you have to choose to stop wallowing in it at some point. I mean, yeah, okay, maybe you can make the most perfect case that your life and your job fell apart because someone else did you dirty. And I'm sure there are many cases like that where that could occur. But at some point, you have to stop wallowing and say, I have agency in my life. And regardless of what that person over here did, I can still make choices that are going to facilitate whatever I want to achieve. Um, I just want to pull up this super chat from Dragon Water because it's relevant. He says, how will they defend their utopia against the next groups that think it's not good enough? And that's always the case. It's like, it's like, you know, it's, it's always going to be something else. It's always going to be another ask, right? Yeah. You know how they do that? Making sure those groups don't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kill, that you kill, can't leave. Killing them before they before they can be formed. I mean, really. Uh, eliminate the idea, you know, once you have control, expunge uh, the idea of a utopia, the idea of something better. Mm -hmm. um, that's what the Soviets did. This is the best. This is the best it's ever going to be. This is the, the, the pinnacle of human civilization to start to think about anything better is a sign of greed and it's a sign of you know your kind of enslavement to you capitalist systems mm -hmm. so you breed you breed that out of people and then you don't have to worry about it well that's a really good point frank is like one of the things i always notice in these crt trainings is that capitalism is like their number one enemy by far and you know an idea i was playing around with a couple months ago mm -hmm. was okay you you want equity okay, let's, let's do equity for a second. Equity being as we define it as a quality of outcomes versus a quality of opportunity. But fine, let's play in this little fantasy land where we're going to go do equity. Why mm -hmm. don't we right now put an entrepreneurship program in every underserved inner city community that is primarily serving black populations? Why don't we put an entrepreneurship program in every single high school, um, inner city high school in the country to teach those kids only the underserved kids, which let's just assume that most of them are like black and brown for a second because we're playing equity. Why don't we teach them all how to build businesses from the time they're in high school and give only that service to the black kids and, you know, then give them the resources or at least like the, the knowledge to be able to build wealth. If we're talking about systemic racism being um, an issue because white people were allowed to develop generational wealth and black people were not allowed to develop generational wealth, which I quite frankly think there's a legitimate argument to there. Um, like, why don't we start to balance that out by making sure that these underserved communities are given the same knowledge or at least like a leg up to be able to build businesses that will allow them to start developing that wealth. Did the left want to do that? Of course not, because they hate capitalism. Because because supporting that type of program would not increase the social status of white liberals. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it comes down to. Why, you know, sometimes you're like, mm -hmm. why don't they do this? Because you don't understand why what they're really in it for. They're not in it for mm -hmm. the outcomes, most of them. They're in it for the social status. It, it brings them through virtue of supporting it. Mm -hmm. You know, you ask someone like, what, you know, I, I support ending poverty. I'm like, oh, great. Do you support this? Do people yeah. know what that is? Will that, will, that, will that get me the right attention? Is there, is there a Facebook profile frame for it? That should be the, the question. If there's yeah. not, they're not going to support it. If there is, they're going to support it. Maybe we need well, to start doing that, though. Maybe we make Facebook profile frames for the things we want supported and make it virtuous, you know? Like, I, I think that's actually a rather brilliant idea, if I'm honest, <laughs> Frank. But Calvin Cure says, um, do you think King Randall's program can be replicated on a larger scale? Are you guys familiar with King Randall? 
I'm familiar no. with him, but I need to. I'm not familiar. Oh, with him. King Randall is amazing. He has started this school in Georgia, the X School for Boys, where he teaches them oh, how to do like things like fix cars and build houses. And now he's actually they've bought an entire school, and it, it, he's trying to set up like for for you know boys who maybe didn't have positive real role models in their lives and you know he's bringing them into their home and, and into his home and he's actually like a lot of them live with him and it's just like it is incredible and he's only like 21 years old i know that and, and yeah. the only reason i the only reason i know his organization awesome. is because i once got in like this twitter war with someone and i donated five bucks to his program every time the person called me a white supremacist <laughs> <laughs> So well I just done. started doing it. He'd go like, yeah, this is white supremacist. I just donate and post it. And it would just like piss him off. He's like, you think that makes you better? You white supremacist. I was like, dude. And then I would tell him, I said, I said, I've done more for, for black charities today than you have. He's like, well, I'm a teacher. I don't have money. I'm like, I'm a teacher too, buddy. Make a lot more than me. I love yeah, it. Yeah, no, it's a great program. Uh, I like it. I think that, and that's what education, you know, and, and creating change should be. It has to be, um, localized and it has to be um through you know you it's a lot more effective through individual efforts than through creating some sort of mandate that you then expect teachers to execute like well, it, you it's know, only were that easy well <laughs> you know, you know the real it's so the, funny because oh, go ahead, Paul. just because you know they'll say you know boycott uh, or like support black businesses boycott racist businesses whatever but but like supporting entrepreneurship that's to actually create a black business is you know that's a different thing you don't hear so much about um and also there's a lot of attacks on resiliency now is bad mm. um you know there's a one of the shows i've been watching one of the teacher trainings is grit and resiliency are dirty words you know like that you know they I've actually create stress in the body and like you this one presenter was like you die five years earlier if you focus on resiliency because your your cortisol levels that will kill you Okay, well, you know, I'd like to see that study, but um, <laughs> you know, it, there's there's so many vectors of attack on these things that actually do empower people, give them agency, and give them independence. Like Frank was saying, it's about it's about dependency and keep keeping people in thrall, uh, really, of the idea that in some ways, like that, bigotry and racism are the greatest evils ever. I don't think that's true. I think, I mean, how did people succeed? when there was worse bigot bigotry and racism in the past. And what did those people do and how did they function? They did it by ignoring it and doing the best they could and having things of value to offer to people. And, and that's what we should focus on. Um, people will always have racist thoughts or bigoted thoughts. They're not good, they're bad, but they like, to what extent do they pose completely de de debilitating obstacles to success. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think, I mean, they're not nothing, mm -hmm. but they're not everything. So find, find what works. Well, I think it goes back to this idea, right? That um, if you're worried less about what other people think about you and more on, on what you can do and what you can achieve in the world, then we, we should absolutely be teaching kids more about resiliency. And this idea that it creates more stress in the body, so you're going to not live as long. Well, Hans Seiley, who's like basically the godfather of stress research, he was doing it back in the 1950s. He was researching stress from a medical perspective. He was quoted as saying that if the moment that you live without stress, you're dead. We will always have stress in our lives. It's a matter of how we handle that stress and how we cope with that stress. And do we focus on problem focused, uh, co problem focused coping strategies or do we focus on emotion focused coping strategies? And the, for the problem with not teaching resiliency is that you are leaving an entire, especially in schools, you are leaving an entire generation of students focused only on emotional focused coping strategies which are never going to solve the problem and are only going to make the stress worse. If you want to solve problems, you have to focus on problem solving coping, coping strategies. But, um, you know, one of the things I was thinking about with, uh, with King Randall and the, and the bitch of this whole thing is that the state of Georgia is trying to shut down his school. The last I heard, oh. they were trying to, uh, like he's trying to build, he, they, they literally raised enough money to buy a physical school and the state of Georgia 
and I don't know this, the current status of this, this is like from several months ago, was like, nope, you can't open your school unless you follow our state standards. And um, Dragonwater says, because solving the problem doesn't let them use race or sex to get votes or make money. And it's just like, it all seems like a little bit of a racket sometimes, but I want to make sure we're about to come up on the two hour mark. And so I always like to wrap things up around the two hour mark because things just get silly after the two hour <laughs> mark. Um, is um, So are there any, like, wh like, what are our white pill moments? Can we end on a positive note? Like what white pill moments are you guys seeing out in the land of education? <sighs> Awkward pause. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, this, I, is, this I, is a tough one. I, I'm, it's a little bit hard for me too because I've just been in this sort of DEI training cave. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think Virginia was a great white pill moment. I'm looking forward to more progress there. Just the the more and more attention this these things get, the better it is. Um, I'm not going to say the worm is turning because it's a big worm and you mm -hmm. can't really tell. Uh, but those things make me feel encouraged. I, I got a good one. Um, and I, I think a lot will depend on how this goes, but, uh, in about two hours I'm having, um, lunch with a, uh, left-wing, uh, black nationalist activist. In, oh, good. Uh, community. Right. Because, um, after my board speech, he, he went up there and his name is uh, brother blanks and he goes, I'm like, oh, great. You know, because I, I, I watched it afterwards. I walked out of there. But he's like, uh, Mr. McCormick has some problems with the school district. I got some problems with the school district. So, okay. He's like, he said some uh, nasty things about me. That's okay. I have thick skin. I respect him. I was like, oh. He's like, because anyone, you know, willing to put their job on the line must believe what they're saying and, and have good intentions. I was kind of like, OK, you know, I did. I put him on blast on the website, not for personal reasons, but for uh, his kind of affiliations and ideological leanings and being involved in um, the sorry, the announcements. Problems with <laughs> what happens school. when you live stream from a school. <laughs> right. And um, <laughs> And so I actually reached out to him. I said, hey, man, I said, I saw your uh, video and uh, afterwards I said, I just want to say I appreciate that. I said, I have, I have a lot more respect for you now that you were like willing to uh, defend me, someone who, you know, was supposed to be your enemy. And we kind of got to talking and I said, all right. I said, um, I said, I'll pay for lunch. I said, and he said, okay, well, then you get to pick. And I said, let's go uh, have a conversation. So that's what we're going to do because he wants to, he said, let's find out like we, we have a, a common enemy. Uh, the, the Waukegan Public Schools. Let's find out where we can work together on that. Let's discuss some of our, you know, disagreements. I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, he's probably very ideologically entrenched, and I'm very, I, I'm not necessarily ideologically entrenched in any one set of ideas, but I'm very opposed to kind of his ideology. But it's it's going to be interesting. I um, I think I feel like it's just to, even just to have that kind of connection. It's like you know, in That's Russia. Great. Russia and the United mm -hmm. States talking, you know, during the Cold War. So I, I got him uh, McWhorter's new book, Woke Racism. Um, I even had a chance to read it yet, but I was like, you know, he probably has not been exposed to this and I've heard good things. So I said, I told him, I said, you bring a book that you want me to look at. I'll, I'll bring a book. Um, Charles Love. Um, I hope it comes today. If not, I'll have to drop it off to uh, Brother Blanks afterwards. But uh, sent me, I bought um, a copy of Race Crazy as well, and oh, good. Charles write a little message to Brother Blanks, you know, Merry Christmas and stuff. And I, yeah, I, I hope he. I think that'll be a connection because you know, it'll be like he's really big on like black identity politics, and you know, and that's his business. But I'm gonna say like, look, you got two black authors here, give them a chance. Um, they're talking about the things you're passionate about, and let me know what you think, and then I'll read his book, and I, I feel good about that. It's it's cool, and I'm hoping to be able to post about it later. And you know, I told him, I said I won't discuss you know anything you don't want me to, you know, with on Twitter. But I said, uh, you know, I'd like to get a picture with him and say like we did this. If we can do this, you know, then you can talk to your conservative parents uh, at the Christmas table and and forgive them for voting for Trump. Yeah. So that's sorry. great. That's great. Yeah. That was, I want to know how it goes. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to to talk being able to talk about. It. Yeah. Well, and and Reagan says in the chat for another white pill. She says I'm from Georgia. King Rando moved on from the original property, <clears throat> but successfully found at least two other establishments to use and is doing great. 
I have no doubt that King Randall is going to succeed. That kid is a force of nature. Um, well, I mean, I guess like, so maybe to, to, we gotta, we got at least a couple white pills. Um, I don't know. My white pill is I see more people. This might not be a white, this, this could be a, any manner of color of pill, depending on, I guess, your perspective. Um, I think my white, white pill though is seeing more people than ever pull their kids out of the public schools. Um, and in New Hampshire, at least we have, um, a bill that's, uh, that is, uh, so in, in the last legislative session in New Hampshire, uh, we successfully funded education freedom accounts at the state level. And mm -hmm. now there's an additional bill to fund them at the local level. So the bill would allow for local uh, school districts, I guess, to vote. And if they get 60% of the vote to fund these education freedom accounts at the local level, then that is going to give parents many more resources to be able to, quite frankly, make choices about what type of education they want their children to succeed uh, or to ex to to get and, the, and to be able to get the funding for that. And it is actually substantially cheaper to do it that way than it is to continue to spend nine thousand thousand dollars per student um for enrollment in the public schools so i know you guys are, are teachers and so i don't know how you feel about um you know essentially defunding the public schools but i quite frankly think per student in new york city oh it's Do insane it. it's yeah. insane because i mean here's the thing it's like you know some people look at school choice and they say okay this is this is going to take money away from the public schools and that will be bad but the fact of the matter is it's the only way to make public schools actually accountable to the people that they should be accountable to it creates a system of competition and if you're giving parents the choice and you are providing the best educational option then you're not you're going to be fine. So it's not about defunding the schools as much as it is about uh, creating a system of competition that requires the public schools to be just as good, if not better, than homeschooling or charter schools or the private schools that they can afford with these education freedom accounts. And I frankly don't see anything wrong with that. I think that, um, for, in my opinion, the public schools need to step up their game. And that's, again, not to say that I think that every public school teacher is bad or has nefarious intentions, mm -hmm. because I just don't believe that's the case. I think that most of them are probably good people that are just trying to do their jobs. But if they can get better, then we should encourage them to get better rather than just continuing to throw money at the problem and assuming that money is the thing it's going to fix. Because, you know, a stat I saw is there has been a huge increase in Los Angeles from last year to this year in the amount of spend per public school student. I want to say it's like a 30 percent increase. So it's something like, I mean, ridiculous. And the full the um, almost I, I want to say I'm quoting Corey DeAngelis in a tweet, so I'm probably going to get it wrong. But it's like 80 percent of that increase does not actually go towards students in the classroom. It goes towards educational psychologists and I'm sure DEI consultants. So throwing money at the public schools is not necessarily impacting the students in any real way. Um, it's going towards more consultants and more bureaucracy and more administration. And I don't think that's good. Um, so my white pill is gonna be education freedom accounts and declining public school enrollment. <laughs> yeah, good to those me. are, all, those are great things to celebrate. You know. and, yeah. It's mm -hmm. a monopoly. I mean, you have a, you have a you have a real situation. You need competition. We yeah. do need. I mean, look, I public education. I, I believe the only way to to win this war is we're gonna you know taxpayers are gonna have to play scorched earth. And when I say defund public mm -hmm. education, I mean defund it until these buildings collapse under the weight of their own rotten infrastructure. Public education has to go. It has to go. It is rotten. It's like, um, I, you know, it's like being in a Soviet Union and you're trying to like, well, maybe if we uh, fix how this factory processes this good and pull, you're trying to pull these different levers in this dysfunctional, broken bureaucracy, it has to be defunded. Um, I'm fine for, you know, publicly funding vouchers. You have like, everyone gets an equal voucher in the state and you let the market do what it does best, which is provide goods and services. And um, there's a lot of ways to get really creative. Parents could take that money and homeschool. You could have incentives, you know, you'd say, well, why wouldn't private schools then just max out their tuition if everyone gets, you know, 15,000 per child? Well, then there could be an incentive for parents to save money by putting, rolling it into like college savings funds or who knows what. I mean, there's just so much creativity out there. And for every idea I can think of, there's 10 that I haven't thought of that someone else, you know, 
who knows more on this or who's smarter than me will think of. And that's my big argument for decentralization um, is people say, well, what's your solution to school and education? It's like, I don't have one. I'm not mm -hmm. smart enough and I can't figure it out, but I know other people can. I'm looking over here for my income tax bill because there's actually a graph in my income tax bill that shows that 73, not my income tax, sorry, my uh, property, property tax. Here it is. Here, okay, here it is. Pro much, le much less fun. My property tax. There is a chart in my property tax bill that shows that 73% of my property taxes goes towards funding the public schools. 73%. And it's kind of like, if I wasn't paying that 73%, that's that's extra money that if I had kids, I could take and invest in educating my kids in the way I, I see fit. And it's just like, I don't think people realize, like we are we are actively contributing money to a racket. It's a racket. <laughs> it tells me this. Mm -hmm. it tells yeah, somebody me. on the chat is just saying, you know, taking away their money will make them more competitive. I guess it's kind of a snarky thing. I'm not really sure, but but it's not their money. It's your money. It's not their money. It's, yeah. I mean, what makes what makes people think the money is theirs? Mm -hmm. It's 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 this entire it's this crazy sense of entitlement that bureaucracies have um, that needs to go. It's really right. a mindset right. change. Yeah, it's not you know. It's like it's like taking your. Um, oh God. Talk about the inefficiency of public bureaucracies, you know, like can't use emails. You have to continually announce things on a loudspeaker point after point. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, yeah, I agree. Um, it... <laughs> there, Frank school is like turned into like full on 1984. <laughs> it's like, it is. Like, this, is. this is like, this is like my Orwellian hair. Or hell, bar, bar, bar. <laughs> well, I guess we are coming up on two hours now, so we might as well um, wrap it up. But I want to thank you guys for an awesome morning chat. And, you know, I love doing this stuff. I would love to do more of this stuff next year. If you guys ever want to come back, you guys know, you guys both know how to reach me. So um, maybe we can organize a regular education casual chat or something yeah. like that to keep people yeah, updated. Let's do a round table. We can get some people on. Yeah, let's do that. I definitely want to get I want to I, I, I want to get Lindsay on to talk about critical pedagogy. And if you guys want to join that and have a chat with uh, Lindsay about critical pedagogy, I would love that because I don't know as much about that stuff. I just I have questions, um, but I'm sure you guys do. <laughs> yeah, that'd be yeah, great. That's I think a lot that'd of, be a lot of good stuff. Cool. Yeah. Well, uh, Carlin, thank you so much for uh, having me on and, and Paul on yeah. me. Uh, yeah, thank you, Carlin. It's great. Yeah, Appreciate I love it. you guys. Yeah, any anytime I get a chance to chat with the two of you, two of my favorite people, honestly. Um, <laughs> so where can people reach you and get in touch with you if they want to follow up? I did put, um, guys, just so you know, I do have uh, Frank and Paul's Twitter information in the chat. I also have a link to Frank's website. Um, so where, like, Frank, where can people get in touch with you if they want to? I think the easiest way is uh, Twitter, and if people send me a DM, I um, usually will give them my, you know, personal email to, um, you know, either continue a conversation or look at what they have or give advice. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my uh, base of operations. Cool. And Paul, how about you? Yeah, same thing. DMs open. Uh, send me a message. We'll follow up on email. Cool. Mm -hmm. And I cannot wait to see those DEI trainings that you've been suffering through. And my oh, condolences man. to you because I understand how hard it is to watch that stuff like hours a day. It's why I don't have any hair. I've learned a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, masochistic, but I've learned a lot. Yeah. And it's necessary. It's necessary to know what they're doing because we can't effectively fight it if we don't know what, we're, what they're doing. Right. Mm hmm. All right, gents. Well, I guess that's all we have for today. Uh, just to remind everyone in the chat, please mount that like button on the way out the door. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I will be back live streaming at 930 tonight with Joshua. We are doing our show tonight. Joshua took another look at his calendar and realized that he is available tonight. Um, he thought he wasn't, but we, the show will be on at 930 tonight. Um, if you guys, so guys, I do, I do a show every week with a psychic. I'm a little weird. You guys know that. Um, and we talk about the news and then Joshua tries to predict what's actually going to happen using his psychic powers. It's actually pretty accurate, freakishly accurate. Um, Frank, you have ask something to say? About my, uh, yeah, ask him, ask him what happens to my uh, career.
Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna in I'm gonna be tuning in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask that question. I'm gonna and I'm gonna put in there. Uh, w what happens with me career wise? I will ask him. I absolutely will. We'll pull up your picture. I'll I'll, I'll make him watch a few minutes of your school board speech I, I see um, to prepare him. Employment lines in your future. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have him pull some tarot cards just for you, yeah. Frank. Okay. Mm, cool. I like it. I like it. All right, guys. Well, I get, oh, yes. So, oh, yes, Jared, Jared, thank you for pimping my locals. So, Jared, I will be doing the local Zoom later. Guys, if you want to join my locals at uh, kb.locals.com, the link is in the description. Um, for my supporters, we will be having a community Zoom call at 6 p.m. So, it's an open Zoom. Any supporter can join. We'll talk about what's going on, but that is still happening at 6 p.m. today. So, I'll be looking forward to seeing folks in my locals for that. All right, guys, I guess that's all we have for now. Take care. Have a great rest of your day, and we will see you a little bit later. All right. And thank you to Paul and Frank for joining me again. Thanks, Carly. Thanks. Bye, guys.